Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, Garson and Shaw, for inviting me. It's, it's really a pleasure. Um, as Dave just indicated, I grew up in the recycling industry in a small family warehouse, metals warehouse. Um, what my bio doesn't usually mention is my grandmother managed a thrift shop. So I come from where you come from, and when I speak to trade groups, I always think of it as sort of a family conversation because I think of y'all as sort of brothers and sisters in the same kind of activity that I grew up doing. But I'm a journalist, and the way that I understand, and I think many of you understand recycling is by, and reuse is by traveling and going and seeing other forms of recycling around the world. And so today I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey. We're going to go to a few different countries and maybe even planets. Um, to understand a little bit about how recycling and reuse are shifting um, and how my thinking has shifted. So let's start out in the mid-2000s. This is a junkyard in southern China. I was in southern China and the man who owned the junkyard heard I was in town and he said, come and see my junkyard. I grew up in junkyards. I love junkyards. I said, yes, I'm coming. Um, that pile right there, he asked me if I knew what it was. I said, I didn't. He said, that's three helicopters I just imported from Los Angeles. Different than any helicopters I'd seen, but that's the fun of going to a scrapyard. Um, you get to see things like this. So we walked around, and we saw this. I thought these were maybe, from a distance, extension cords, power cords. I'd seen this kind of thing in uh, scrapyards before. Then I got closer. Christmas tree lights. Huh? That's a lot of Christmas tree lights, isn't it? Now, at the time I saw this, I, I, it was just a light bulb went off for me. I was astounded. I said, I am going to write a book about recycling, and I'm going to start it by explaining to my readers how Christmas tree lights are recycled. Easier said than done. Uh, Joe, the owner of the plant, said, no, 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 we got to go to dinner. So he wouldn't take me to where it was done. But I made it a goal to figure it out. And so, uh, at the time, I was living in Shanghai, and I called this gentleman. His name is Johnson Zeng. Uh, he is a scrap metal trader, and at the time, he was based in Vancouver. And Johnson's job was to drive around the United States going scrapyard to scrapyard to scrapyard to scrapyard to scrapyard, buying wire, mostly low grade wire, like Christmas tree lights. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? How many folks here have driven around to thrift shops and various warehouses and bought clothes? Well, Johnson did the same thing. And he would pay cash, there'd be an immediate wire, and the wire would be packed into containers and shipped back to China. So Johnson said, come on the road with me for a week, and I'll show you where I get all this stuff. So I said, sure. So. We drove all over the United States. I believe this was just a garbage bin of Christmas tree lights in Ohio. Uh, these were, I believe, in Indiana, North Carolina. That's nothing. That's nothing, but that's a lot. So after, um, after a week of this, um, driving around, seeing piles of junk Christmas tree lights, I said, Johnson, please, let's, you know, can you hook me up? Can you send me to the Christmas tree light recycling factory in China? And so he said, when you get back to Shanghai, which is where I was living, he says, you call my friend Raymond. And Raymond's in southern China, and he will take care of you. So uh, I got back to, southern, to Shanghai, called Raymond, and Raymond said, come on down. And of course, nobody's going to let you see their factory without having a meal first, right? It's the same in every industry, especially so in China. The great thing about the scrap business, um, the metal business, is I don't care how big it is, they all start as family businesses. It's all family. And maybe they grow up, but it's all family businesses. It's one of the reasons why I love to spend time. So this is Raymond's family and a couple of friends he threw in. And Raymond doesn't really like being photographed that much. So all you can see are his legs, the brown legs there. He actually leaned out of the photo. But this is his board of directors, if you will. Um, and they were doing very well at the time this photo was taken. This photo was taken in 2011. Now this is, I'm not going to show you many charts today, but this photo shows you the history of U.S. exports of scrap, paper, metals, plastics, 
textiles of all kinds to China up to 2015. Now look where it peaks. That's right about the time the media started figuring out all these recyclables were going to China. As usual, when it comes to recycling and resale, you know, the media's a little late to the story, aren't they? This was the peak of the era, the golden era, if you will. And what was all this stuff going to? You know, we hear in many countries, the U.S. was dumping this stuff. It was just being thrown into landfills and burnt. Does anybody in this room believe that? Of course not. People were buying it for raw materials. We'll get to why it declines in a minute. So, what was Raymond doing? I'm going to show you in a moment, just one second, one second before we start it. I'm going to show you how he was recycling those Christmas tree lights, 2011, and this continues to this day. But one thing to keep in mind is, this is not the way Christmas tree lights were always recycled. There's a much simpler way. You put them in a pile, you get some gasoline and a match, and you set them on fire. And come morning, you have a bunch of charred wire. The problem is, it's horrible for the environment, right? Um, and by around 2011, people in China weren't very interested in breathing the fumes from burning Christmas tree lights from North America anymore. So somebody had to innovate. And Raymond got his uh, nephew, who had just graduated from a top technical university, to design this system. Um, for scale, uh, there are in this town, at the time this was taken, about 10 Christmas tree light recycling plants. And they were importing into this town um, somewhere in the range of 25 million pounds of Christmas tree lights from around the world. So um, I am going to talk you through this. I apologize to the translators because I'm going to go, because um, it's a short video, it's, I'm going to go quick. So hopefully it works okay. So please, get, please hit play. Okay. First thing you do is you cut a bundle of Christmas tree lights and dump them in there. That's a shredder. That's not smoke. That's steam because you feed that with water to keep the blades cool as they spin around because otherwise it gets super duper hot. Okay, out comes what I call goo. It's water, plastic, metal, glass. The trick is how do you separate it? It's really cool. Check this out. This is a water table. It's leaning up this way and water is shooting up it. The light stuff, the plastic, the glass goes off one side. The heavy stuff hangs out down there. It took a month to get this thing calibrated, and you can see the clean copper, mostly clean copper and brass, pouring off here. The question I always get is, what happens to the water? Does it go back into the river next door? No. Uh, it just circulates through the system. They just take a pipe, bring it into the system until it evaporates, and you're going to see in just a moment what this looks like. The camera goes down. How great is that? Sure beats setting it on fire, yeah? And you can get a, here's a better look at another one in the same town. Um, it's essentially panning for gold, the idea of using specific gravities. Okay, so this is great. This is peak sort of import of scrap into China to make new stuff. Oh, people always ask me, what happens to that stuff? This is great. So, the plastics, are separated out, and Raymond was selling them to a slipper manufacturer. So the plastics will be made into soles. The copper um, and the brass, it's kind of a mix. It's recycled into new wire for, brace yourselves, Christmas tree lights. So round and round and round it goes. And anybody who tells you, I hate the phrase, inventing the circular economy, come on. It's been around forever. You all know that. OK, but why is this the peak period? Well. Something funny was happening in China. First of all, China's getting old. China's getting very old. Um, in 2011, the working age population peaked. And suddenly, it starts to decline. As it gets older, like other economies, um, growth starts to slow. And if growth starts to slow, and you're manufacturing less stuff, you need less raw materials. So here you go. 2011, right around the time that the, the working age population peaked, that's when the import of scrap materials peaked, and suddenly population declines, growth declines, imports of raw materials decline. Now, 2018 is an interesting year. Um, that's the year, 
Everybody in the room, I think, knows about National Sword. That's when China passed a policy, established a policy, saying that we're not going to import or be a dumping ground for stuff from the West anymore. Um, that's not why they did it. They did it because they didn't need as much stuff, and China was growing rich, and they had their own sources of metals now. They had their own sources of textiles. Anybody in the room compete against uh, Chinese clothes, say, in East Africa? It's the same idea. They have a growing economy, they have their own stuff. So for me, at the time I was covering all this, I was a recycling journalist. I was working for trade magazines. And I was seeing this decline in 2011. It, it started to trouble me because I started thinking, what is the West, the affluent West, going to do what is, as she told me to slow down, uh, what is the affluent West going to do with all this stuff it sends to China to recycle? And this became something I was really worried about. Where is it all going to go? And as I like to do in my life, there is a story, a narrative, a book, and movies that sort of help me explain a little bit of everything. Star Wars. The truth can be found in Star Wars. So, I want to show you something very important about Star Wars. If you watch any of the movies, any of the TV shows, there's junkyards in all of them. Every single film has a scavenger, a junkyard. This is episode one, or depending on how you look at it, episode four, we're not going to get into that debate. Um, but this is episode one, and here we have a junkyard. The funny thing, about this junkyard is, there's lots of junk, there's no recycling. There's no recycling equipment. No balers, no shredders, nobody cutting anything apart. Episode four or one, we have the Jawas taking R2-D2 to the sand crawler. They remind me, the Jawas remind me of my relatives in the early 20th century. They do, because they were scavengers, you know? Go and, go and get the stuff off the street and put it in your truck. Now, the funny thing about the sand crawler is there's no recycling in the sand crawler. It's just a bunch of stuff. What are they going to do with the stuff? They fix it up and they repair it. What's going on here? Here's my favorite example of very strange things in the green economy of Star Wars. Episode 5. Empire Strikes Back. The Star Destroyer <laughs> is going to go into hyperspace. We learn at this moment that Star Destroyers dump their garbage before going to hyperspace. Now, look at the garbage. It's steel. Now, you take that to any junkyard anywhere in the galaxy and they're going to pay you money for it, but the Empire clearly sees no value in this steel. I think that's weird. So what's going on here? Well, one more example. This is from episode seven. Yes, episode seven. Uh, this is Jakku, giant star destroyer, slammed into a planet. This always reminds me of the shipbreakers in Along India. Have you ever seen those pictures? You see those giant ships, and they take them apart by hand? Well, where are the people taking apart the star destroyer? They're not there. Instead, we have my recycling hero, Ray, she goes in there, and she knows what a Star Destroyer has inside, and she takes out the valuable parts. And she doesn't recycle them. Well, in the sense that they aren't melted down. Instead, she takes them to this dude, and she sells them for, as parts, and she gets paid for the parts, for their reuse value. This is a very strange economy where there's only reuse. I'd say it's a good one, but I always wanted to understand why that was the case. And then I examined episode three, where you have this battle on Mustafar, which is a volcano planet, where all they do is make steel. In other words, the commodities are worth nothing. It's endless, endless supply. So if there's any value in the stuff in that universe, in the stuff in our universe, it's in reuse. And that's why you see everybody in the Star Wars universe learning to repair, learning to put things back together. It's a reuse economy. It's not a recycling economy. 
And to me, that's very exciting. And, uh, and here we have Ray, who grew up a scavenger on Jakku, and yet she somehow knows how to fix a very complicated spaceship because it's a reuse economy. Going back to planet Earth. All right. This is my friend, Robin Ingenthron. And this is uh, a picture taken of him right around 2006, he believes it is. Robin, I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to say two words, okay? Or you don't have to, but I'm going to say two words. I just want you to see what pops into your mind. China, e-waste. What do you see? Fires, environmental devastation, right? Okay. This is Robin with CRTs, old computer monitors, cathode ray tubes. He's going to ship these to China. He's, uh, now, if you told people then and now that Robin was going to ship computer monitors to China, they see those pyres, funeral pyres of electronics. What actually happened in those days with those CRTs? Here's a plant in southern China. They take them apart. Right, right around 2006, 2007, there was at least one and probably more distributors shipping CRTs from Los Angeles to southern China, 50,000 per day. You think they were shipping them to set them on fire? No. They ship them here, take them apart, recalibrate, change the voltages, fix them up, put them in nice cases, and ship them back to the U.S. as monitors. How great is that? We're talking tens of thousands per day. Back in the day, if you were buying what they call now a white box monitor, you know, a generic monitor, it very well could have been a reused monitor. To me, that's really exciting. Um, and unfortunately, um, the industry never had a chance to show how proud it was of this kind of thing because for various reasons, it got smeared in the press. This got missed, but it's a great story and it's worth being proud of. When I talk about e-waste in China, people always say to me, okay, okay, but what happened to the other stuff? What happens when it breaks down? So, let's go to a place called Guiyu. If you've ever heard of the largest e-waste dumping site in the world, that was Guiyu. As a journalist, I'm always skeptical whenever somebody tells me there's a largest anything, because I can usually find a bigger one. Whether Guayu is the biggest or not, I don't know, but it isn't what it was made out to be. You go to Guayu, and you find things like this in warehouses. This is a pile of Samsung uh, phone boards. Now, you could say, if you have just one phone board, there's not much you can do with it, right? But if it's 500 of the same board, that can be made into something, no? You can use those, and that's what was going on in Guayu back in the day. Um, and if you cannot use those, I'm just gonna tell you, uh, I'm just gonna tell you what the name of that is. For example, on this particular board, there's a chip called the Texas Instrument OMAP3630. Who knows what that is, right? But if somebody in Guayu is interested in getting that chip in large quantities, there it is. They just need to extract the value. And that's what they were doing down there. 80% of the revenue in the world's largest e-waste dumping zone was from reuse. It was from pulling chips off of these boards. Knowing what they were, the Texas Instruments OMAP 3630 going into there. And what did they do with them? Well, uh, well, let me go back a second here. Hold on. What did they do with them? Uh, Guayu was located next to a place called Chanteau, which is the world's largest toy manufacturing zone. All those chips were being used, reused in toys. Signage. It's a reuse story. It's a reuse story. And this is a familiar story to people in this industry. It's having people who know how to find that OMAP 3630 knowing how to pull the vintage. What's worth having knowledgeable employees? This is a Goodwill, back room of a Goodwill in Arizona. Those knowledgeable employees pull stuff out. 
What doesn't sell maybe makes its way to Mississauga. Knowledgeable employees pull things out. Sort, what do they do? They sort for various markets. Maybe they sort for Port Klang in Malaysia, where I live. Maybe they sort uh, for Congo. Maybe they sort for Benin. It's lost, oh, the mic, there it is. Uh, Benin. And again, it's having knowledgeable people one step along the way, one step along the way, who know how to pull that value. You know, we heard this morning from a wonderful business that knows how to pull that value, sort that value, segregate that value, create jobs, businesses, and ultimately clothing that can help people. All right, back to China. This is an amazing place in Shenzhen. It's called the SEG Mall. Um, it is a hub for the global electronics industry. This is 12 stories high, and it's lots and lots of little stalls like this selling computer chips, boards, whatever kind of electronic component you could want. It's all used. And you can go in there and say, I want that Texas instrument, OMAP 3630, and I need 3,000 of them for a run of toys that I'm making next week. They'll get it for you. Now, people will tell you, you go into the SEG mall, they'll say, oh, some of that stuff is new. I am here to tell you, it's all used. It's all circular. It's all resale. Next door is the Apple market. Now, this is a very interesting place. China is the world's second largest market for Apple, for the iPhone. When those things break, when they when people don't want them anymore, they ultimately make their way to southern China where people take them apart. And what happens to those parts? They go on sale in this mall. Here's phone vacuums. Here's screens. Um, here's the mall. It's four stories high, and you can go in there, and you can buy all the parts you need to build your own iPhone from uh, iPhones people didn't want anymore. And if you don't believe me, there is a great YouTube video that everybody should watch called How I Made My Own iPhone in China. Highly recommend it. It's, it's fantastic. It's about 30, 23 minutes long. Let's go back to Vermont. Okay, Robin Ingenthron, the guy who is sending CRTs to China. Uh, this is his warehouse. He is an electronics um, recycler, and as we all know, CRTs, tube televisions, they're not a thing anymore. It's flat screens. Robin now recycles those. And he started wondering where he could sell those for reuse. He didn't want to see them recycled. He figured there had to be a market for them. And he started thinking, oh, you can do this again. Close your eyes. If I say e-waste, Ghana, what do you think? Something like this? Okay, this is a hard word to say. Apologies to the translators. This is a place called Agbogbloshi. Agbogbloshi. Okay. This too has been called the world's largest e-waste dump. Sensing a theme here? If you look at the world's largest e-waste dump, that's a lot of coconuts on the ground, isn't it? It's not the world's largest e-waste dump. It's, it's, a, it's a local dumping site, but it's very easy for journalists to visit. It's easy to go to Ghana, land at the airport, take a plane, see a few pieces of burning wire, and say, aha, this is what's happening to all our electronics. But that is not what's happened to our electronics in Ghana. All right, that's Robin on the left. Uh, I talked to Robin yesterday. He said, I have, if I can, I can use the photo, but I have to tell you, he's lost 60 pounds since the photo was taken. <laughs> so that's my duty to Robin. He wants you to know he's lost. He's doing the keto diet, he said. All right. So, so sorry, Robin. All right. That's Robin, and he's standing next to a wonderful gentleman by the name of Olu Orga. I love Olu. And I write about Olu in the book. Olu, when he finished high school up in the northern part of Ghana, he moved to southern Ghana, 
and got a job at Agba. I think I, oh, there I am. Um, and there are electronics that go to Agbag Bloshi because it's the main city dump. They go there, and then they go to all the repair shops around Agbag Bloshi that journalists never visit. And Olu started looking around, and he said, this is interesting. And so he learned to repair computers. And he learned where the computers came from. They weren't coming from Ghana. They were coming from places like Vermont. And he moved back up to Tamale. Tamale is the capital of northern Ghana. And he and some friends started importing computers to sell in Tamale. And so here is a picture he put on WhatsApp to all his followers up there in Tamale saying, look what I've got, fresh load of computer monitors. Who wants them? You know who wants them in Tamale? Schools, hospitals, parents providing first computers to their kids in school. It's cheaper. It's a way to bridge that technology gap. And they can't get enough. Sound familiar? Okay, this is the town of Tamale. Wonderful place. Interesting thing about Tamale, which I think goes for a lot of um, West Africa, where I've spent most of my time in Africa, so I, can, I feel comfortable speaking of Tamale. 90% of the commerce is secondhand. I'm talking anything that's a hard, durable good, apparel. All these stores are secondhand. It's hard to find new goods. So the shop that Olu spends his time selling out of with his buddies, this is a place called Chendiba Enterprises. Um, and uh, that's Kamal, one of his partners. And you can see all these desktops. There's no market in North America for these desktops. But there's an awfully strong one there. They want this technology. It helps them bridge the gap. And there's no shame in selling it. They feel good about it. Accra, uh, the capital of Ghana. This is a shop called Buji, uh, owned by my friend Steve Edison. Um, we'll go inside. This is actually right on the edge of downtown. And it's, he found a great... Uh, deal on the real estate in the middle of this parking lot. So let's go inside. This is the repair shop. Now, these laptops on the wall will not be sold as laptops. They're like a library of parts. And so if somebody brings in their laptop and it's not working anymore, say the monitor blew out, you just take one from there and screw a new one on. When Wahab goes, uh, well, I'll show you. When, when the buyer who buys these computers goes to North America, he isn't just thinking about selling whole computers, he's also thinking about parts. Going deep, having the knowledge of what a local market needs, just like you. You know what those local markets need when you're buying or distributing into them. Back to Vermont. So I've said in my books, in my other journalism, that there's too much of an expectation that the developing world learns from the developed world. In my opinion, it really should be going in the other direction quite often. I mean, what we're seeing in some of these pictures is we're seeing models of reuse and recycling and capturing value um, that should be replicated in wealthier countries. Robin Ingenthron thinks so. Here's his warehouse again. He started out thinking he's going to sell monitors to Ghana or to anywhere in West Africa. Then he saw how they parted them, how they looked at the value, that the value may not be in the TV itself, but boy, there's a lot of value in the parts. And he said, you know what? We're going to do that. And so he set up a little photo studio, and he started asking his employees to take these apart, take pictures of the parts, post them to eBay. In a matter of six months, he went from selling $200 a month of parts on eBay to $50,000. The demand is there, you know? And it's a model that didn't come out of Vermont. It's a model that came out of Ghana. Which brings us to another point that I think is important. When we talk about regulation of this industry, I think far too often, the people who are setting and writing the regulations 
are those who are throwing the stuff away. Which is really backwards, isn't it? Shouldn't it be the people writing the regulations who want to use it? Who want to use that stuff? It's crazy. Um, and so that's why one of the reasons why I like what Robin has done. Okay, only a couple more here. That's Robin. Again, he's lost 60 pounds. Um, and that's Wahab Muhammad, who I write about in second hand. And Robin's saying to Wahab, some of these parts are too old to sell on eBay in North America. Take them back to Ghana, see what you can do with them. And so maybe I can supply even more than what we're supplying already. And so a few weeks later, Wahab uh, did a FaceTime call from Tamale with uh, the head of the repair union in Ghana. And they discussed with Robin what works in the market and what doesn't. You know, it's, I think, again, the sort of thing that happens in this business all the time. I think it's something to be proud of. Everybody who does this business in Ghana with these parts is really proud of it. Why are they proud of it? Creates jobs, ensures that people in Ghana who can't afford new stuff have access to new stuff, builds skills. It's a wonderful story. Um, and it raises, it raises the image of the industry. Back to your industry, worn wear. This is Patagonia's used, uh, used uh, clothing site. It's, you know, if you go to Patagonia these days, you can try and buy something new, or they'll have a button on their site that says you can buy used too. Um, I know many of my friends in the uh, secondhand clothing industry aren't thrilled about this. I am thrilled about this because, again, it's the same sort of thing. Patagonia, this very high-end brand, is coming to North America and saying, secondhand is high-end too. They're enhancing the value. And I think that's good for everybody. Maybe some of this stuff isn't going into your supply chain, but the overall value of the industry rises up as companies like Patagonia recognize that there's some value here and there's something cool about it. And cool matters in fashion, no? Thread up, I'm sure we've all seen this, but I think what's been interesting to me, and I've sensed it in North America since I've been spending more time here since COVID, is that Gen Z, that young cohort, that young generation, they are now from you know, sort of mid-90s to the mid-2010s, they like secondhand in a way that my generation didn't in North America. 82% consider resale before purchasing something. That is extraordinary. That is such good news for this industry. And it's the sort of thing that if harnessed well, if you can tell young people in North America that resale is good, if you have young people in North America and Europe who think resale is good, it becomes potentially a great story about resale elsewhere. The stigma of export, I think, erodes. And I think that's very positive. I live part of the year in Malaysia, and I know it's not just rich kids in North America who feel this way. I'm, I'm struck by young Malaysians, young Chinese, I lived in China for 12 years, how they are embracing this outlook as well as they move up into the middle class. So I think it's a good story. Peer-to-peer, um, -peer, Poshmark. We heard today, um, just a couple hours ago, how we, are going, we have a company in Central America going to sell clothes Use clothes back to Americans. If you go on Poshmark and you look up Malaysia, and unfortunately this was the wrong slide, I realized that about uh, 10 minutes before I went on, there are Malaysian uh, secondhand sellers who are now picking through clothes in Port Klang, finding stuff that Americans want and selling it on Poshmark. It's reversing. That's the greatest thing ever for anybody who's concerned about uh, the image of this industry being harmed by export. It's now, it's now the emerging markets who, on a small scale, but nonetheless are exporting as well. And I think that's very positive for how things uh, bode for this industry and all resale industries. So I'm going to end uh, on that point uh, and with a picture of Ray, who is my recycling reuse hero. I have a picture of her, this picture actually on my desk, both of my desks. Um, and I hope we can all sort of embrace her outlook and move towards a more Star Wars-like resale economy. Thank you. And I'm open to any questions. <laughs>